Hey, hello, welcome, and uh, thanks for joining our webinar today. My name is Ku Lee. I am the Director of Targeted Outreach at the Department of Financial Protection and Innovation, also known as the DFPI. This is part of our financial education webinar series. Um, this webinar is called How to Pay for College. We got a lot of really great information, um, I, but I know we're right at 12. I know some of you are going to lunch right now, um, so I'm going to give everyone another minute, one more minute to log on before we get started. Okay, thank you for your patience. Okay, um, thank you and welcome to, uh, welcome to our webinar. Again, today's webinar is How to Pay for College. It is part of the DFPI's monthly financial education webinar series. Uh, we have a lot of really great speakers today and a lot of really great content. Let's go ahead and get started. <clears throat> First, a little bit of housekeeping and some important information about this webinar. This webinar is being recorded and it will be published to the DFPI's YouTube channel. There's a link to it right there um, later today. And also everyone who registered for this webinar will get an email, a follow-up email that includes the slides as well as a link to the YouTube video. Um, for this webinar, your microphones and cameras have been turned off. But if you do have a question, please feel free to submit it to the Zoom's Q&A feature. Um, we will answer the questions live at the end. We have a little dedicated section to do that. Um, and also, if you do have any uh, questions, additional questions, feel free to email us at outreach at dfpi.ca.gov. Okay, let's get started. First of all, uh, who is the DFPI? Who are we? What is our role? Um, well, the DFPI is California's licensing and regulatory agency, um, you know, regulating state financial institutions, products, and professionals. We conduct audits to ensure compliance, we review consumer complaints, and we pursue legal actions against those who are operating illegally or are using unlawful, deceptive, or abusive business practices. Um, another big function that we that the DFPI does is we provide consumer awareness presentations, uh, financial education uh, you know, as courses throughout California to help protect consumers um, from falling prey to frauds and scams. Um, so if you want to learn more, we do have a website. It's uh, dfpi.ca.gov. Okay. Uh, with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Michael Lemus, who is the Outreach and Marketing Manager at the California Student Aid Commission. Michael? All right. Well, thank you all for joining me. And I wanted to go ahead and jump on video for the first minute or so just to make sure that you see a face uh, on behalf of the commission. And I get the chance to go ahead and work with students and families across California, making sure that they have access to financial aid opportunities. So I'm going to turn off my camera for the rest of it so that you don't dist get distracted by the slides and also my video, but know that there's a real person here and also the fact that we're very excited to go ahead and connect with you all today. So with that being said, we can go ahead and pass it on to the next slide. Thank you. So a lot of people wonder, okay, I know I hear that there's financial aid out there. There's supposedly all this free money. How do I access it? So right off the bat, if you are either a student, if you're listening, or you are a parent or a family member, or just know someone that can actually access financial aid, I want you to know that the process is fairly simple. And you have people here, including folks at our agency over at the California Student Aid Commission to go ahead and help you. But it all begins with an application. So you're either filing something known as the FAFSA, which is the Free Application for Federal Student Aid or the California Dream Act application. And I'll touch base on each of those applications in a bit, but the process starts with submitting an application. You only submit one. 
And that process is going to go ahead and run you through many different forms of aid opportunities, whether that be from the state, the federal government, the institution. So whether you're going to a community college or a four year or something in between, there's a lot of financial aid out there. And we're in a state like California that provides a lot of different resources for a lot of different people. So please take advantage of it. Once someone submits their application, then the school that they actually applied for, that college is going to go ahead and determine how much aid is actually available, if any, based off of a lot of different things. So how much money the actual household brings in, the amount of people that are in the household, different resources they have access to. Essentially, every single person is on a case-by-case -case basis and has run through the system to go ahead and see how much aid they can actually qualify for. So the colleges are actually looking at that and what you actually submitted in one of those applications, again, either the FAFSA or the California Dream Act application, and then looking to see what type of documentation, if any, you need to go ahead and submit. If, for example, you are run for something called verification, that means you're submitting additional documentation to the school in case they need to go ahead and verify any of your information. But again, the process itself is fairly simple. It then continues on from the school determining your eligibility. And then the student, of course, the student making sure that they are constantly checking their email. If there's anything in the mail that they need to go ahead and correct or add in, they can go ahead and do that. And then, of course, at the very end, they get the money. They get the money to go ahead and pay for various things like tuition that could be used for books. It could be used for different things that a student may need to make sure that they can go ahead and, of course, have a college education or an education beyond high school. So that's the financial aid process. If we go on to the next slide, I just want to talk to you all about the various forms of aid that are actually available and what they all mean. So there's four basic types of financial aid here. The first that I want to go ahead and amplify are grants. So grants are money that you do not need to pay back. I know there's a lot of conversations about student loans right now happening at the national level, but here, what I want you all to know is that in the first form, number one, grants. Grant money is typically based on the family and their family need, and so they do not need to be repaid. And similar are scholarships. Scholarships are usually based off of merit, so things like grades, maybe the student is involved in a particular sport, maybe student government. The scholarship money is typically awarded based off of accomplishments. There's some in between, but again, scholarships also don't need to be paid back. So this is free money that is available, and there's a lot of it available to students and their families. The other is work study. So this is only for the students that apply through the FAFSA, but essentially students can work at an institution like a college or a university and actually get financial aid um, through their work. And they can get professional development with that too. So that's a bonus. And then of course, last but not least, some students will still end up needing student loans. And so the important thing to know about the student loan program is that really people need to just assess their different options and make sure that they're aware of what they're actually accepting. So if we go on to the next slide, please. So we have the California DREAM Act application and the FAFSA. And no worries if you all can't remember all these details. I know that this is being recorded. It's going to be sent. But there are two applications here in the state of California. One is the California DREAM Act application, and the second is the FAFSA. Students and their families are actually only submitting one, so that is very important to note, and I'm about to tell you all who submits what. So if you go on to the next slide, please. As I mentioned, there are two applications, so there's the California DREAM Act application and the FAFSA. So a lot of people are very familiar with the FAFSA. It stands for the Free Application for Federal Student Aid, but a lot of folks don't know about the California DREAM Act application. So here in the state of California, we actually have aid available for undocumented students. And so they can actually apply through the California DREAM Act application. The websites are on the screen, so you can go ahead and check those out. But the California DREAM Act is actually run by the California Student Aid Commission. So we are the agency that actually administer that application, whereas the FAFSA is a federal application that is actually run by the Department of Education. So we manage it, the California DREAM Act here in California, and the FAFSA at the federal level is managed by the Department of Ed. Uh, but again, students are only submitting one application. Sometimes they accidentally submit both, and that can really uh, get things a little bit messy. So we want to make sure that we make sure to emphasize that it's only one application that would be submitted. If we go on to the next slide. Um, some examples of federal aid I wanted to go ahead and just go through with you all so that you can actually see how much money is actually available. So students actually have access to many forms of grants and aids. Uh, one of the most popular are Pell Grants, and you can see that that's up to $6,895. There's also work study that I mentioned. Of course, there are loans, and those amounts vary. 
and there is a difference between subsidized and unsubsidized loans. So the big thing that I say when it comes to student loans is that if a student or their family is interested in a loan, just make sure you read through all of the fine print because there are usually interest rates associated with them. Sometimes they're fixed, sometimes they are not. And so you wanna make sure that as you're making a family decision, they are looking into all the details before you actually submit yes on any of these loans. But grants, grants are again, money that you do not need to get paid back or you do not need to pay back. And again, there's a lot of money, thousands of dollars available out there and it is paid by the government. So please take advantage of it. And we'll go on to the next slide. And that is state aid. So here in California, we have a lot of financial aid available, a lot of financial aid available. So whether a student is wanting to get a certificate program at a community college or wanting to pursue a four-year degree, there is aid available. And so that is really what I want to emphasize. Eligibility for most of our state aid programs are just automatically determined by simply submitting the California Dream Act application or the FAFSA. So really, it's just starting off with that one application. And again, you are run through the system to see if you're eligible for various forms of aids. One exception is our Chafee grant for foster youth. So we do have an actual grant application specifically for foster youth. They can actually have access to even more funding beyond what they would actually get through the California Dream Act or the FAFSA. The thing here that I want to mention is that typically our state priority deadline here in California is March 2nd, so that's a date to be really aware of, but students that are actually wanting to go to a community college have till September 2nd, so including students right now, so students that are wanting to go to a community college this fall, for example, still have through September 2nd to apply for financial aid and to be run through the system to see if they're eligible. Um, again, the Chafee Grant for Foster Youth is something that is can actually even be taken outside of California. But for most of our state aid programs, again, you just need to submit the California Dream Act or the FAFSA and you should be good to go. And if we go on to the next slide, some help, helpful tips here. So we tell people to get their applications in as soon as possible. Every year, typically applications open up on October 1. This year is going to be a little bit different because the application, the FAFSA, is actually getting simplified. So it's going to go from about 100 questions to about give or take 40 questions. So it's actually going to be opening up in December this year. That's only in 2023. Every other year, it's going to go back to normal. It's going to open up on October 1. We tell people apply by March 2nd by that state priority deadline, but you still have time through September 2nd if you're going to a community college. I want you all to know that we really highly recommend that you apply for financial aid regardless of your income and that you create an account to make sure that you are keeping track of your grant status, check your email, and do not be afraid to ask for help. We are here to go ahead and assist you. And please spread the word. We also have workshops and webinars to assist you through the process. And if we go on to the next slide, I think we're almost, yes, we are. So um, I invite you all to stay connected with us at the commission. Here's a QR code. This has our important links. You can go ahead and access our resources, our social media, um, and the applications themselves. But with that being said, I want to go ahead and just say thank you to the team for having us here and also to you all for engaging in the educational process. Thank you, Michael. A lot of really fantastic information from the California Student Aid Commission. Um, they're a partner with the DFPI. We do a lot of events together and fantastic work over there. Um, let's go to the next presenter. I want to uh, please welcome Dana Salas, Outreach Specialist. As outreach specialist for ScholarShare 529. Thank you. Yes, we'll be presenting information about uh, how to save for college. So first of all, let's go ahead and uh, get some information about who we are. Next slide. Yeah. So ScholarShare 529, we are a 529, which is IRS section code 529, which encourages families to save for higher education with tax advantages. And we are ScholarShare 529 is the official California college savings plan. And we've been around for over 20 years. And this other stat that we have over 13 billion in assets just shows that parents and families are saving with our program and they're saving for higher education. So you could trust that it's a program that helping families. And we are overseen by the ScholarShare Investment Board which is chaired by the California State Treasurer. So we are a state-sponsored program. So you can be sure that um, your money would be in good hands um, if you decide to open a plan. Next slide, please. And why are we giving you information about this? Well, if you look at the numbers and the cost of going to college, it can really add up. 
these are just some figures, uh, maybe per semester. Um, that adds a lot, adds up a lot if maybe private four years, that can add up over four years. And it doesn't include living costs. And one of the main reasons why these plans, 529s, were created was to encourage parents to save because the student loan, it's called the student loan epidemic. There's about $1.7 trillion in student loan debt. So we encourage families to save so that perhaps they can avoid taking out student loans. We know that student loans are, are you know, they could be used, but that could take a long time to pay off and cause stress. So uh, we encourage families to save. Next slide. So who is eligible for opening a five to nine? going to be an account owner, usually 18 um, or older, have to be a U.S. citizen or resident and have a social security number or ITIN number. There's no income requirements or um, nothing like that. So it's usually an account owner is a parent. It could be yourself um, too. So not you don't have to save just for your kids. You could save for yourself too if you want to pursue another degree or get your PhD. The beneficiary is a has, doesn't have to be a relative, and they do have to have a social security number or tax ID number. And anyone can contribute. Obviously, the account owner, the parent is going to be paying for it for the most part, but there are different options like a U-Gift, which is a program that helps uh, a lot of different people save into your plan. So it's not just going to rely on, on you, um, but others can help out like during parties. They may want to gift you some money. It could go directly into a college savings plan. Next slide. And why I say with Scholarship 5 to 9, it is an investment program with tax advantages. So in the blue graph, you see that that's the money you're going to be saving over time. Um, it adds up, but the orange is all the earnings you can make um, with investing. We have different investment options that are more conservative, some that are more aggressive, depending on your uh, comfort level. Um, but the earnings can add up. It means more money to, to pay for higher education. Next slide. And families can use the money for more than just college. They can use it for higher um, community college, um, studying abroad, and they could use it um, throughout the, the country, the state, um, obviously in the world, like I said, studying abroad. So we are the California plan, but you you can use the money for uh, to pay for schools in other states and around the world. Um, you can cover different expenses like laptops, um, computer supplies, things like that. and you can also change beneficiaries if uh, one child maybe decides not to go to college. Um, you can always change it to another child that does, or maybe they, they change their mind and they want to study later. Um, and then you can withdraw for other purposes because the money that you're, you've been saving is your money. You can take it out whenever you want. But remember that these plans were created to pay for higher education. So if you don't use it for that, then you would get a penalty on the earnings only. So you won't lose all your money. You'll just have to pay a penalty on the earnings. So that's the only thing to consider if um, um, just, just in case you want to uh, take advantage of these plans. Next slide. So how do you sign up? It's really easy. It takes about 15 minutes or less, depending on your um, your, your uh, pace. Um, you could go to scholarship5to9.com. It takes, it's really easy. And first, you're going to select who you're going to be saving for. Then you're going to decide how much to save. The minimum to open an account is just $1. And then um, you could save every month or um, manually, like maybe this month you're going to save $100. Next month, you're only going to save $30. It's really up to you. There's no set plan, like set uh, payment arrangement. It's really up to you. And then you're going to select your investment portfolio. We have over 18 different portfolios. Um, so it's really flexible. And then you're going to fund your account. Remember, the minimum is just $1. And then you're going to um, pay for it. Usually it comes out of your bank. So you're going to have those kind of details ready. Um, and then some employers, you may want to check with your employer. They may offer a direct deposit option. So the money that you want to save can come right out of your paycheck. So check with your employer. Um, if some of you are uh, employed with the California state, you can have, uh, there's already a payroll deduction option available. So um, you could check with them, but just check with your employer just in case. Next slide. Now, I do want to talk about our CalKids program that works together with Scholarship 5 to 9, um, that it is uh, um, administered by the Scholarship Investment Board, uh, which is also through the California State Treasurer's Office. So this program was launched last year, 
2022. And it gives children with a seed deposit automatically. Enrollment is automatic and families are not required to contribute. So this money may already be out there for your um, children to take advantage of. There are some eligibility requirements. There's two cohorts that I'll talk about in a little bit, um, but it's automatic. So you may want to just go and check to see if they have you have this program. Um, so um, next slide. So who's eligible? Like I mentioned, two awardee groups, newborn awardees. So the newborns, every child born after July 1st, 2022, automatically gets a seed deposit. And then the next awardee group is the public school low-income students, grade first through 12th grade. So if they qualify for this program, um, then they get a seed deposit automatically as well. So in the next slide, we'll see how much they get. Next slide, yeah. So for the school-age children, they do have to be eligible um, public school low-income students. The first um, deposit that they would get is $500 automatically and first to 12. And this was uh, counted from the academic year 2021-2022. So some seniors that graduated in 2022 may already have this money just sitting there waiting for them to uh, get. So go ahead, if you have questions about this, you have a senior um, or you know just maybe a freshman still, um, go ahead and check. Well, I'll give you information on how to check, um, but even the minimum would be $500 that you already have in there perhaps the next level, um, you would get an additional $500 if eligible students are identified as foster youth, and then an additional $500 if um, students are identified as homeless. So $1,500 up to $1,500 um, through the CalKids program. Even the, the first one, $500 is still a good amount um, that could pay for different things, books and supplies. So definitely check, the, um, check if you're eligible, but the next slide, please. The next one, uh, the newborn awardees, um, any newborn member born after July 1st, 2022nd born um, moving forward. So every every day a child is born in California, um, they get the initial $25 deposit into a CalKids account. Um, and this is to encourage families to get started early as well, to start saving for college. Um, and then they, there's a few other incentives, um, $25 extra if the parent actually uh, goes into register the CalKids account, and then an additional $50 um, when they open a ScholarShare 529 account, or if they already have a 529, when you link them together. So that's how the CalKids program works with the ScholarShare 529. So you link it together, and the money in CalKids can grow with interest in earnings. So that's how that would work. Um, but take advantage of this program if you qualify with the newborns. There's no income requirements, um, nothing like that. As long as they're born in California, um, they would qualify. Um, but the public school students, they would have to uh, meet certain um, income eligibility requirements. Next slide. And one thing that I want to mention is April is Financial Literacy Month, and we do have a special CalKids offer specifically for the school age awardee group. So if they open a, um, or if they register and link their CalKids account with a scholarship 5 to 9 account, um, they will receive an extra $50 to get started um, with saving for college. Um, so if you open an account with uh, scholarship and just even open it with $1 and you link your CalKids account, then you get an extra $50. That's the incentive that we're offering this month. And you have until April 30th to take advantage of this if you want to um, get the extra $50. And you can go to CalKids.org. Um, it should pop up automatically to take advantage of the offer. Um, so it's a cool, cool way to get started with saving for college and to raise awareness about saving for college and all the options that are out there. Next slide. And so now, uh, how do you register for CalKids if you want to check your eligibility? Just go to calkids.org and it gives you all the steps that you may want to take. Next slide. So thank you. And again, um, there's my contact information if you have questions about CalKids or Scholarship 5 to 9. But I appreciate you taking the time to learn about our program. Thank you, Dana. Yep, a lot of really great information. Um, I love the Scholarship 529 program. My two boys have an account there. Um, so I encourage anyone who has the time ability to start an um, account and start saving for college for your kids, grandkids, if you have it. Um, okay, with that, I do want to talk about federal student loans, and I want to introduce 
the DFPI student loan servicing OBUDS person, Selena Damien, um, who will talk a little bit more about um, using federal student loans, using, using student loans to pay for college. Selena? Yeah. Thank you, Kuhn. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. It's my pleasure to be here with Michael from CSAC and Dana from Scholarship 529. Um, I encourage everyone to take advantage of those programs to really learn um, about what's available out there. Um, I am the DFPI student loan ombuds person uh, here at the DFPI, and I work with borrowers to help them understand student loans, help them understand their options, uh, repayment options. Um, but as Michael mentioned at the beginning, when you are filling out your FAFSA, you will be awarded certain grants in your, um, your package. It will be a combination of grants, work studies, and, fed and student loans, federal student loans. So the Department of Education will offer a student, depending on their the school of attendance and the need, will offer them a certain student loans. So today I'm just going to give a brief overview of those and just really emphasize the important points and things that you need to remember when really weighing out your options. So for federal student loans, the Department of Education is your lender. That means they are lending you the money all loans have to be paid back with interest. So what is really important to understand the difference between direct subsidized and direct unsubsidized loans is the way that the interest accrues. With direct subsidized loans, the Department of Education pays the loan interest while you're still in school. After you graduate or you leave school and after the grace period, then your interest starts accumulating. With direct unsubsidized loans, the interest starts accruing immediately after disbursement. Therefore, those direct unsubsidized loans will be cost will cost you more. So if you you can pay the interest while you're in school, if not, the interest will accumulate and be capitalized, meaning that the interest will be added to the total amount of your loan. So once you graduate, the amount you borrowed will already be higher. Then you also have, you may be offered direct plus loans. There's two type of loans, grad plus and parent plus loans. Now, grad plus loans are available to graduate or professional degree students, and parent, parent plus loans are available to parents of dependent undergrad students. Now, what's important to remember about these loans is that they are unsubsidized, which means they are accruing interest from the start, the time of disbursement. These loans also carry origination fees, which are going to be higher. Parent plus loans have higher interest rates, and they do require a credit check, um, which means that so these loans have to be paid as soon as they are dispersed. So parents don't get a break on these. They have higher interest rates. So really something to consider when looking at your at the award package for the student. And then you have your direct consolidation loans. These are not ones that are awarded, but once a borrower does have loans, which they can have a, a mix of loans, they can consolidate their loans into one with one payment. But for the students that are just looking at their award letter, really making those decisions, it's just important to understand what how the interest is accumulating with those loans. Next, please. Once a borrower exhausts all their options with the with federal loans and Department of Education is no longer offering uh, loans, a borrower has the option of taking out private loans. Now, private loans, again, these are related to college costs and are usually your lender is going to be a bank, a credit union, it could be the school, or it could be an online lender. So this could be your Discover, your Wells Fargo, this, this is a separate lender. The terms of these loans are set by these lenders. And it's important to understand that these, pro, these loans have less flexibility and fewer protections than those offered by Department of Education. So when you take out federal loans, the interest rates are fixed. You qualify for certain income-driven repayment plans for certain forgiveness programs, possibly down the line. With private loans, you don't have those they don't have to offer those, basically. You just have fewer protections. So it's really 
important to understand what it is that the student is taking out, interest, read the fine print, um, income share agreements. It's a new type of financing that we're seeing, and I just want to mention it. California does consider um, income share agreement as a student loan product, and they are, we are in the middle of really setting up um, uh, regulations for those providers of income share agreements. So basically what it is, it's a student loan that's given to a borrower um, where the borrower promises to pay a fixed percentage of their income over a set amount of time after they finish school. These are brand new. M many of you may not have heard of that of these, but if you are, once you've exhausted your federal financial aid, your loans, and you're looking at other options, this may be something that you come across. They are riskier. Um, and again, we are, California is really just one of the first ones to really um, regulate and, um, you know, just regulate these servicers. Another one of, uh, another product that we're seeing is buy now, pay later. And now these are going to be more with um, unaccredited profit institutions or career technical schools. The only reason I'm mentioning it is just to be aware. So these are loans offered by an accredited or unregulated for profit schools, installment loans where the consumer split the cost of a purchase. So it could be like the buy now, pay later, um, the firm, you're going to see those where there's no financing for the first or no interest for the first four months or certain amount of time. So just be very careful when you are seeking out other forms of financial aid or ways to pay for college. As Mike and Dana mentioned or as they shared, there's a lot of resources, especially in California. So these are um, just just be really careful when you're looking at this. And I think the most important thing that I want borrow or students, parents to remember is just exhaust your federal loans first. Um, those are going to be the ones that come from the Department of are offered from the Department of Education. You can have a mix of loans, subsidized and subsidized, federal and private. Again, it's really important. Read the terms of anything that you're signing, your promissory note. And if you're taking out private loans, read the terms of the interest and um just make sure you know that you will have to pay those back with interest. And so the loans that you're, the amount that you're initially taking, be taking out will be higher than, than the initial amount. Um, and borrow only what you need, track what you are borrowing, and just know that there are resources and other ways to help you. Next, please. Um, and just some borrower protections for those borrowers that have federal and private loans. California does have the California Student Borrower Bill of Rights, which protects borrowers. Um, it requires that servicers, who is a company that helps you with your payments, that's sending out the bills, they have to work in the best financial interest of all California borrowers. They have to help you understand your repayment options and help you stay out of default. They must help you apply for forgiveness programs. Um, they have to apply payments and overpayments correctly, and there are special protections for military borrowers, those in public service, older borrowers, and borrowers with disability, and I am also available to help you answer questions about your loans, help you understand your rights and options once you get into uh, repaying those loans, which typically will be six months after you graduate or leave school after the grace period. Um, you can also file a complaint with our agency if you are having any issues with your student loan servicers, which hopefully you won't, um, and you'll take advantage of all these other great resources that um, we talked about today. Now I will hand it back to Ko. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Selena. A um, lot of really great information on student loans. If you're not aware, we actually have a student loan playlist on the on our YouTube channel. It's got a lot of different information. It's such a complex issue, but Selena does a fantastic job of covering a lot of different topics. Um, so please check that out if you uh, get the chance. All right. <clears throat> I know we're a little past 1230. Um, if you need a bug out, um, I know it's supposed to be a 30 minute webinar. You're more than welcome to. Again, we are recording this webinar. Um, and we will publish it to our YouTube channel so you can watch it later. Um, if you do have any questions, again, please feel free to submit it into the Zoom's chat, um, the Zoom's Q&A feature, and we will answer it at the very end. Uh, okay, so 
Um, I did want to cover some other different ways to pay for college. Uh, just to kind of round out everything. Again, this is a very high level. So there are options such as community and military service. Um, you can join the Peace Corps. They don't really offer any college assistance programs, but once volunteers finish their two-year commitments, um, they can earn up to $10,000 um, to be used for whatever they need to, um, including college uh, tuition. Um, AmeriCorps offers something very similar. Uh, AmeriCorps is a network of, um, you know, uh, public service programs that connects, you know, uh, community service um, to education, environment, public safety issues. Um, so upon completion, members can receive uh, education award. It's basically kind of a scholarship uh, that will help them pay for college education. Um, there are links there to it. And also there's college cords. This is a new one that I didn't know about. Um, so College Corps is a state program offered by the governor's California volunteers. Um, it places eligible students in community-based organizations. Um, fellows can earn up to $10,000 uh, plus college credits in exchange for their community service. Um, and also the last one, um, again, big commitment here, but if uh, you're interested, all military services provide their members and veterans uh, access to tuition assistance programs. Um, so whether it's uh, the Montgomery GI Bill, the post 9-11 GI Bill, many of them also have uh, student loan repayment programs. Um, so, and, and also certain military occupational specialties, also known as MOSs, uh, will provide recruits with enlistment bonuses. So if you're interested in military service, it is there. We've provided some links there. Um, and again, these are additional ways you can pay for college. Um, and finally, here are some other ways, right? Uh, you can always just pay out of your pocket. Um, schools usually will bill uh, students every semester for the number of classes or credits or unions that they, uh, units that they take. Um, after being billed, individuals can actually just pay the school per semester um, out of their own pockets. And as, as Michael mentioned, uh, there is work study programs many colleges offer. Um, most of them, some of them are federal work study programs. Um, the other thing I want to throw out there is, you know, family assistance. You know, not everyone has parents or grandparents that can help pay for college, but you may have an uncle or aunt who went to a college that you're going, uh, you're thinking about going to. Um, they may have connections there. They might be willing to help, you know, uh, help pay for some of your tuition or some of your books. Um, and then also uh, one of my mentors talked to me about, um, you know, some countries around the world provide tuition free or low tuition to students, uh, but you do want to be very wary of this because some of the requirements um, require you to be a citizen of the country, um, and then uh, international students may have a discount on tuition. So if you're looking to study abroad anyways, you can think about, you know, ways to get cheap, cheaper tuition, um, just look through that. And then of course, um, the California Department of Industrial Relations, if if college is not for you, um, there's apprenticeship programs. And uh, if you're thinking about becoming an apprentice to any kind of career, uh, you know, electrician, uh, construction, that kind of thing, um, I have a link there that goes to the Department of Industrial Relations apprenticeship program. It's a search data, it's a search in their database. Uh, I do want to caution that um, the educational requirements for apprenticeship programs may vary. Um, some programs require you to take an aptitude test. Um, some may not. Um, most programs require English proficiency, but uh, it's an excellent database. So please feel free to search it. There's a link to it. Uh, you, if you could look through all the different apprenticeship programs that they have available. All right. With that, we're at the Q&A session. Um, Looks like if you, and again, a reminder, if you do have any questions, feel free to submit it uh, into the Zoom's Q&A feature and we will answer it live. Um, I did get a couple of the questions that were submitted to us during registration. Uh, the first one, um, the first question is, what is considered when applying for financial aid? Uh, Michael, did you wanna answer this? Yeah, absolutely. So it's a number of things. So first off, we look at, of course, income for the family, and we look at how many folks are actually in the household. But essentially, what I'd like to say here is that it's very much on a case by case basis. Sometimes we'll hear from families that's like, oh, well, this person got this or this person didn't get this. Is that going to apply to me? 
we really just recommend that folks submit their actual you know, application. And the other thing that I should mention is that when you're applying for financial aid, the way the system is set up right now is that you're submitting tax information from prior prior year. And so if your tax information is not indicative of where you're at today, that completely is normal. And if that is the case, you can always work with the school or the college or university that you're planning to go to and let them know, hey, I know that the application required this, but my finances have changed and they can go ahead and actually look through and make a professional judgment based off of the application information you submitted. Um, but yes, I would say, you know, it, it is highly based on income and need. So how much is the family going to need to actually attend, whether it be a college or a university? Fantastic. Thank you, Michael. Um, here's another question, uh, probably for you. So, uh, how can I pay for college when I don't qualify for financial aid? Um, and this might be in reference to being a DACA recipient, but I'll let you answer it. Yeah, absolutely. So I know there's, of course, as I just mentioned, it's very much based off case by case basis. So when it happens that you, for example, don't apply or don't actually qualify for financial aid for any given reason, whether you don't qualify because of DACA status or because of immigration status, or whatever that may be, there are two things I want to mention here really quickly. The first is don't count yourself out if you have been told that you're not going to qualify because sometimes there's a lot of misinformation out there and people count themselves out and then later realize that they actually could have qualified. So for example, our California Dream Act application is for undocumented students, whether you have DACA or not, you could still potentially qualify for aid. Now, if for some reason you still do not qualify, you're not eligible to go ahead and apply either through the FAFSA or the California Dream Act application, in that case, there's still funding opportunities. And so what I highly recommend is checking in with the school that you're going to attend and then actually looking into the financial aid department there, as well as your academic department, because sometimes there's going to be scholarships that are actually very much related to what it is that you're studying. So there's a lot of scholarships out there. If you do a quick Google search as well, you can definitely tap into scholarships that don't require that you submit a FAFSA or a California Dream Act application. So if anything, I'm going to leave you with these words, which is please do not count yourself out. Uh, yeah, good. Very good advice there, uh, Michael. And I will follow up by saying I, I do have a very close personal friend that graduated college. He's a DACA recipient, and he did get a bunch of different scholarships um, without going through FAFSA. So yes, 100%. Um, Dana, this might be for you. Is this, uh, I'm sorry, is Scholarship 529 for California residents only? So the 529 plan in California that's sponsored by the state of California is open to anyone. So you don't have to live in California to open one. So if you live in New York, let's say you could still open our plan. There are 529 plans across the country. Um, so you could open any one. But we are scholarship 529 is the official college savings plan of California. But yes, anyone can open one, whether uh, no, um, you know, location limits, let's say. Okay, and I'll just follow up and ask, um, does the beneficiary have to live in California or could they live somewhere else? The beneficiary can live anywhere else as well. Um, and to clarify with the CalKids program though, so scholarship 529, um, doesn't have too many requirements, but with the CalKids program, the child or student does have to uh, live in California. For the newborns, they do have to be born in California, um, and eligible students would have had to live in California um, for at least a year. If they do move, let's say they do move out of state, let's say, um, they could still have their five to nine plan, but the CalKids account um, will still be open as long as they have lived in California um, for at least a year. Okay, great. Thank you, Dana. Uh, all right. Um, last question from registration. Actually, this is second to last one. Does the state of California offer assistance to uh, California residents admitted to out-of-state colleges? This, this might be for Michael. Um, does the state of California offer assistance to California residents admitted to out-of-state colleges? Yeah, so one of the examples that I was talking about, for example, for foster youth, is that they can take that Chafee grant that I mentioned earlier to out-of-state institutions, but most of the aid that we actually have is for California institutions, so whether it be a community college or university, 
Um, but I should also say, I know folks mentioned some study abroad opportunities. You can actually qualify for financial aid. And let's say if you do want to go ahead and study abroad, as long as your institution is in California, there is actually potential to be able to use some of your financial aid to actually pay for your study abroad trip. So that's also another opportunity. Um, but most of our aid is actually for California schooling. And I do want to mention with Scholarship 5 to 9, although, you know, we're not offering free money necessarily with Scholarship 5 to 9, Cal kids, we do, um, but the money that you're going to be saving with our program can be used to study abroad. Um, so that's a perk as well. Cool. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Dana. Um, all right. Last question that came through registrations. And again, I want to let everyone know. Um, if you do have a question, please feel free to submit it through the Zoom's Q&A feature. Uh, where can I go to find scholarships or grants? I can go ahead and start us off with that one. Um, and there's a lot of different resources out there. And I would also just say to please be careful as you're looking for scholarships, because unfortunately, there are a lot of scammers out there as well. But um, there's various um, websites out there like CapEx, there's College Board. Um, I'm sure there's also directories for scholarships as well. You can contact us somewhere at the California Student Aid Commission. I'm sure we have a list as well through our training team. Um, but yes, please be careful because I know there's a lot of, unfortunately, people trying to take advantage of families and we just want to make sure that you all are careful before submitting any information. Great. Thank you, Michael. And so that looks like that's all the questions that we've received. Um, I do just want to uh, share contact information from our great presenters. And again, thank you to Dana, Michael, and Selena for joining our financial education webinar series and, and presenting on their uh, fantastic subjects. Um, so here's our contact information. Again, these slides will be emailed out to everyone. And finally, just a little bit of final uh, housekeeping. Uh, subscribe to the DFPI's newsletter. Um, on our newsletter, we highlight diff all the monthly events that we do, um, also different financial education topics. Um, and again, here's a link to our YouTube channel where this video will be published. Um, if you do have any questions for us, here's, a, 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 here's our email address where you can email your questions. And finally, we have two webinars coming up. Um, the Financial Literacy Resource Webinar happening next week at 11 a.m., um, there's a link to it. It's a great webinar where we highlight a lot of different um, resources for individuals, um, financial resources, and there's also going to be a great panel uh, talking about um, creating wealth for all Californians. Um, and then in May, we have a um, Military Appreciation Month webinar uh, where we highlight resources for service members and veterans. That's on May 24th. And there is the link right there to register for that webinar as well. So again, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, I do apologize for going a little bit long, but uh, it was a very great webinar. Thank you to all these uh, guest speakers and um, please take care of yourself and each other. Goodbye. Thank you everyone.